We come together, as we do each week, heavy with the weight of the world, burdened by our concerns, outraged by the newest affronts to human dignity, and tired and weary of the stubborn persistence of old prejudices. We come together, as we do each week, to be reminded of the faith and the life to which we would aspire. Chris Hedges writes of such a faith. This was my faith, that God is inscrutable, mysterious, unknowable, that we do not fully understand what life is about, what it means, why we are here, and what will happen to us after our brief sojourn on the planet ends but that we're saved in the end by the faith that life is not meaningless and random, that there is a purpose to human existence, and that seemingly insignificant acts of compassion and blind human kindness, especially to strangers and those labeled our enemies, sustain the divine spark, which is love. That such human kindness is deeply subversive to totalitarian ideologies which seek to thwart all compassion toward the, towards those deemed unworthy of moral consideration. That those who sacrifice for others, who place compassion and tolerance above ideology, and who reject absolutes stand as constant witnesses in our lives to love even long after they are gone. We come to be reminded of our best selves. We come to be reminded of the moral demands of our true humanity. We come to be stirred to such a life as this. Come, let us worship together. The reading this morning <clears throat> is from the poet Marge Piercy. Her poem, The Low Road. What can they do to you? Whatever they want. They can set you up. They can bust you. They can break your fingers. They can burn your brain with electricity. Blur you with drugs till you can't walk, can't remember. They can take your child, wall up your lover. They can do anything you can't stop them from doing. How can you stop them? Alone, you can fight. You can refuse, you can take what revenge you can, but they roll over you. Two people can keep each other sane, can give support, conviction, love, massage, hope. Three people are a delegation, a committee, a wedge. With four, you can play bridge and start an organization. With six, you could rent a whole house eat pie for dinner with no seconds, and hold a fundraising party. A dozen make a demonstration, a hundred fill a hall, a thousand have solidarity and your own newsletter, 10,000 power and your own paper, a hundred thousand your own media, 10 million your own country. It goes on one at a time. It starts when you care to act. It starts when you do it again, and they said no. It starts when you say we, and know who you mean, and each day you mean one more. The events of Palm Sunday, as they are described in the Bible, demand to be read as an act of political resistance motivated by a spiritual and moral ideal. Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem is an act of political theater. Biblical scholars John Dominic Crossan and the late Marcus Borg, in their book about the final week of Jesus' life, tell it like this. There were actually two great processions that entered Jerusalem on a spring day in the year 30. From the west... Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, entered Jerusalem at the head of a column of imperial cavalry and soldiers. It was Crossan and Borg, right? A show of force, a visual panoply of imperial power, cavalry on horses, foot soldiers, leather armor, 
helmets, weapons, banners, golden eagles mounted on poles, sun glinting on metal and gold, the sounds of an army marching and the beating of drums. The mission of the troops marching in with Pilate was to reinforce the Roman garrison permanently stationed in the fortress of Antonia, overlooking the Jewish temple and its courts. It was the custom of the Roman army to make a show of military force during the Jewish festivals. It was the beginning of Pesach, of Passover, and the Roman army was there in case there was any trouble. Passover, after all, is the celebration of the Jewish people's liberation from bondage in which Yahweh sides with Moses and the Hebrews against the powerful Egyptian pharaoh. And even the Egyptian army is powerless to stop the deliverance of the Israelites. It's the type of celebration, the type of festival that would make Pontius Pilate a little nervous. The other procession, the counter procession, as Borg and Crossan call it, comes from the east. With Jesus riding a donkey or a colt down from the Mount of Olives, His followers, a group made up largely of peasants and outcasts and the dispossessed, join the procession and line the roads. They cast their cloaks on the ground before Jesus. They wave fronds of palms and lay them on the ground before him. They shout, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Crossan and Borg write, Jesus' procession deliberately deliberately countered what was happening on the other side of the city. Pilate's procession embodied the power, the glory, and the violence of the empire that ruled the world. Jesus' procession embodied an alternative vision, the kingdom of God. Jesus' procession was an act of resistance, resistance to empire, resistance to dominion, Resistance to an ordering of the world based on conquest, violence, power, and wealth. The events of Palm Sunday demand to be read as an act of political resistance motivated by spiritual and moral values and ideals. It was the biblical theologian Karl Barth though later Billy Graham would say the same thing and then William Sloan Coffin would say it even later, who called on ministers to preach with a Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. And so inspired by this story, this Palm Sunday story of resistance by Jesus and his followers, I am led to ask what forces forces of violence and dominion demand our faithful resistance today? What counter-procession are we called to join? Turning from the Bible to the newspaper, it seems clearly like we've entered a political season and a cultural season in our nation that is marked by excessive anger, by vitriol, by coarseness, by violence, by bigotry, and by hate. The focal point, the focal point for much of the political unrest has centered within the candidacy of Donald Trump for President of the United States. In just the past few days, not one, not one, but two major religious groups in the United States have issued statements concerning the current political climate in our country. I will read first at length from a really direct statement from the Union for Reform Judaism, the largest Jewish denomination in the United States that they issued this past Monday. The Union of Reform Judaism, if you go to their website right now, it's on the front page. They write these words. As a religious movement, we do not endorse or oppose any candidates, and we do not do so now. But Mr. Trump is not simply another candidate. In his words and actions, he makes clear he is engaging in a new form of political discourse, and so the response to his candidacy demands a new approach as well. We cannot ignore the many issues on which Mr. Trump has spoken clearly. His campaign has been replete with naked appeals to bigotry, especially against Hispanics and Muslims. 
His extreme anti-immigrant rhetoric reminds us that our own ancestors' access to American shores of freedom and promise were once blocked with deadly consequences. When he speaks hatefully of Mexicans and Muslims, we recall a time when anti-Semitism put Jews at deathly danger. We cannot remain silent, for we have been commanded to remember the heart of the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Meanwhile, the very next day, Tuesday, the House of Bishops of the Episcopal Church issued a similar, though less direct statement, which read in part, quote, in a country still living under the shadow of the lynching tree, We are troubled by the violent forces being released by this season's political rhetoric. Americans are turning against their neighbors, particularly those on the margins of society. They seek to secure their own safety and security at the expense of others. There is legitimate reason to fear where this rhetoric and the actions arising from it might take us. Those two texts from the uh, Reform Jews and from the Episcopalians, while carefully or less carefully parsed, are full of pretty intense ideas. A new form of political discourse demanding a new approach, recalling a time when anti-Semitism put Jews in deathly danger, we cannot remain silent, the shadow of the lynching tree, there is legitimate reason to fear. And so the statements from both the Union for Reform Judaism and the Episcopalian House of Bishops warn implicitly of a question I will now ask explicitly. Do the political currents in our society represent a move towards fascism? Is fascism the correct term for what we are seeing? The answer, as it turns out, will depend on what your definition of fascism is. My favorite definition comes from historian Robert Paxton, who says, fascism may be defined as a form of political behavior marked by obsessive preoccupation with community decline, humiliation or victimhood, and by compensatory cults of unity, energy, and purity in which a mass-based party of committed nationalist militants working in uneasy but effective collaboration with traditional elites abandons democratic liberties and pursues with redemptive violence and without ethical or legal restraints goals of internal cleansing and external expansion. Paxson himself, in an interview given last month, warns against the sloppy use of the word fascism, saying... I'm very, very reluctant to use the word fascism loosely because it's almost the most powerful epithet you can use. George Orwell issued a similar warning concurring in when he wrote in 1944 that the word fascism is almost entirely meaningless. I've heard it applied to farmers, shopkeepers, social credit, corporal punishment, fox hunting, bull hunting, bullfighting, Kipling, Gandhi, Chiang Kai-shek, youth hostels, astrology, women, dogs, and I do not know what else. (laughs) Orwell says, almost any English person would accept bully as a synonym for fascist, and they use them interchangeably. You can find if, you're interest, find, if you're interested in it, dozens and dozens of lists, some by political scientists, some by public intellectuals, some by people with dubious academic claims, listing the five or six or ten or twelve or fourteen defining characteristics of fascism. If you're interested in such lists, I would recommend an essay by the recently deceased Italian philosopher and novelist Umberto Eco, entitled Eternal Fascism. 14 Ways of Looking at a Black Shirt. Um, And I would say that it it may not be more politically, uh, it may not be, you know, from a political science perspective, any more insightful than the others, um, but it is better written than any of the others. But these conversations about the definitions and characteristics of fascism are academic. I'm interested less in semantics and more in what our role 
what our role might be in the current cultural moment that is being played out through political candidacies, but also transcends the election cycle. What is, what is the role of resistance? What is the role of resistance for us? In the current cultural moment, we are witnessing, among other things, a sharp rise in the activity and in the public boldness of white supremacist organizations. This is not altogether new. The Southern Poverty Law Center reports that beginning in 2008 with the election of President Obama, there has been a steady rise in the number and activity of white nationalist organizations, reversing a decade-long trajectory of stagnation and even decline. These groups have grown recently in the past few months more outspoken. Numerous white supremacists, everyone from David Duke to the neo-Nazi website, The Daily Stormer, and on and on, have endorsed Trump in droves and taken his candidacy as a signal to be more public, to be bolder, to be more outspoken. And so our resistance, our role of resistance, has to be a resistance to white supremacy, has to be a resistance to that pernicious lie of white supremacy meant to divide the vulnerable people, turning them against one another when solidarity and common cause is what will truly save and improve. The role of resistance on the front cover of the Order of Service, I, uh, I, went, and found a, I went and found an image of Woody Guthrie. Woody Guthrie with his guitar um, inscribed with the slogan, This Machine Kills Fascists. Um, the, the slogan, This Machine Kills Fascists, was actually during, during World War II. Um, people in factories, not just factories making weaponry, but factories making you know, washing machines and factories making you know, boxes would write on the machinery, this machine kills fascists, and it was a statement of sort of common cause, of, of, of social unity. Woody Guthrie wrote it on his guitar to uh, point out that as important as factories were, um, that we would need the humanities, the arts, beauty, art, music, song, to express to express that drive within us. I'm actually told that uh, Pete Seeger, who is a disciple of Woody Guthrie, actually uh, got out his banjo and wrote in small, smaller letters, this machine surrounds hate and forces it to surrender on his banjo. How many people knew that about Seeger? You got a couple, a couple there. This machine surrounds hate and forces it to surrender. And so part of the role of resistance will be turning to the arts. There's also that kind of resistance that we've seen in the streets in Chicago last weekend, in Arizona last night. That kind of resistance that comes forward and boldly says no. That says this is a message that is not welcome in my community. This is a message that has no place in civilized discourse. This message is not welcome here. And that is a form of resistance that we should embrace. Karl Popper, the great 20th century philosopher, wrote, unlimited tolerance must lead to the disappearance of tolerance. If we extend unlimited tolerance even to those who are intolerant, if we are not prepared to defend a tolerant society against the onslaught of the intolerant, then the tolerant will be destroyed and tolerance with them. We should therefore claim in the name of tolerance the right not to tolerate the intolerant. We should claim that any movement preaching intolerance places itself outside the law and should consider incitement to intolerance and persecution as criminal in the same way as we should consider incitement to murder or kidnapping, or to the revival of the slave trade as criminal. The last form of resistance, the last form of resistance that we need to embrace 
are movements of resistance that are yoked to movements of kindness. For if our movements of resistance are not yoked to movements of kindness, then they themselves risk, run the risk of becoming perverted. And so I'm reminded of Jesus' counter-processional, counter-movement into Jerusalem. And that political speech, that political speech is buoyed in the character of Jesus by a movement of kindness, by healings, as the Gospels tell us, by feedings, by inclusion, explicit and heartfelt inclusion of the lowly and the dispossessed and the outcast. And we will need that too. We will need our movements of resistance always to be yoked to movements of kindness. Those are my thoughts on resisting fascism. One is realize the white supremacy that is at the core of that is at the core of the political discourse and resist that. Two, choose a resistance that honors the arts and the humanities and that claims that spirit. Three, three, resist by saying no, by saying no to intolerance, by being in the streets. And fourth, to always yoke movements of resistance with movements of kindness that remind us that we're on the right path. Thank you.